we don't have Pete to say something silly at the beginning of the show. So there you go. Uh, Kelly, you could have filled in for that. but <laughs> I should have. I guess you chose not to. Seeing as how you constantly berate Pete for doing that, I thought I'd better not. I'm berating him in a fun way. And I just put a mint in my mouth right before I start the show. So I'm a true professional. Uh, welcome to the Lovecraft Teasing Podcast. Uh, this is uh, November the 4th, 2018. Um, our guest today is Mike Carey. Hey, Mike. How's it going? Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for being here. I know uh, it's late where you are, so I appreciate it. Uh, oh, thanks for having me on the show. Sure. Why don't we do our introductions as per usual? And um, then I think Ben's going to start with the uh, questions for you. And I think uh, the rest of us will kind of chip in in other, in other areas. Uh, Rick, why don't we start with you? Rick Lay, writer. All right, Philip. Uh, Philip Fercasi, uh, author and screenwriter. Matt. I'm Matt Carpenter, constantly in awe of Rick Lay. We all are. <laughs> Yeah. Kelly. Kelly Young, executive editor of Strange Eons Magazine, also one of the co-hosts of the Dead Again podcast. That's right. Dead Again. What did you guys discuss in the last one? Oh, we went crazy on vampire movies. Eric had picked The Lost Boys for us to discuss, and we just went off on a million tangents of other vampire films. <laughs> okay. That's deadagainpodcast.com. And yeah. uh, Ben, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Ben. Uh, mostly a fan and uh, alcoholic like Kelly. <laughs> Hi, Ben. Kelly, nobody can approach that level. <laughs> uh, Mike, I can't imagine that there aren't a lot of people who are watching or listening to this show that don't know who you are. But just for those who don't, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your, and your work? Sure. So um, I've been writing for, well, I've been writing for most of my life, but I've been writing as a career for about two decades now. Um, I started out working in comics. Um, I did uh, Lucifer, the DC Vertigo. That was probably the first thing I did that um, that garnered any attention at all. Before that, I was working for uh, indie publishers in the UK and the US. I worked for Apocalypse Press over here, for Malibu and Caliber in America. Um, then I started writing for DC. I did Lucifer. I did Hellblazer. Um, at a certain point, I started writing prose fiction as well. Uh, I wrote uh, five novels about a, an exorcist for hire named Felix Castor. Um, and then I started changing my name. I did a few um, projects under, uh, under aliases. This was not my idea. It was my publisher's idea. Um, I did a couple of mainstream thrillers as Adam Blake, um, and then I wrote The Girl with All the Gifts, which is a, a zombie novel, uh, which was published in 2014, and that was when I became M.R. Carey instead of Mike Carey. It's quite a, an easy pseudonym to, to, um, to see through, but the idea was to draw a kind of a Chinese wall across between my earlier works and that novel, because my publishers thought that it... Um, it had the potential to be a sort of a crossover success and to appeal to um, to people who don't read no, don't normally read uh, zombie fiction. Um, that was four years ago. I've written um, four more novels since then. Um, still working in comics. I've just finished writing Highest House for IDW and Barbarella for Dynamite. Um, and I also occasionally do screenwriting work. I did the screenplay for the movie version of The Girl with All the Gifts. Um, I've done screenwriting for European animation for very, very low budget uh, cartoon series. Um, I'm working currently on a, a movie based on another one of my novels um, and a TV series based on a novel that's just about to come out, Someone Like Me. Um, I usually do most of these interviews, but so I'm always happy when someone else on the panel wants to take the load off of my shoulders. Uh, so Ben is going to ask you a lot of questions, but let me just ask you first before Ben gets started. Um, I, I, I read Neil Gaiman's introduction to Lucifer, uh, the first volume. And uh, he had mentioned, you know, wanting Lucifer to be a main character. 
in a, a series or something along those lines and other writers would say something to him like okay well who else would you have in mind and uh i'm wondering how it got from from that to mike carey writing lucifer for neil gaiman yeah that 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 was that was a turning point in my life um i i'd been trying out you know i'd been i guess i've been writing comics um for various small presses for about seven or eight years by that time. Um, and I pitched, I pitched a ton of stuff to DC um, and got some, some friendly replies from um, Elisa, Elisa Quitney, who had been the editor on Sandman in its last days. And um, she invited me to pitch for The Dreaming. And I did, I pitched, I pitched a whole bunch of, um, uh, of concepts for one-off stories in The Dreaming. Um, none of which uh, uh, re really, uh, none of which were accepted, none of which had legs. Um, and then things went really quiet, and I thought, okay, I've blown that gig then. Um, it was like a year and a half where I didn't hear anything from, uh, from any of the Vertigo guys. And then Elisa called me up to say that they were launching a new line of books, Sandman Presents, and that they wanted a Lucifer story. And she asked me if I would like to pitch for it. <clears throat> And I said, yes, please. And she said, well, you'll need to do it really fast because we need, we need a pitch in three days and we need a script in two weeks. Um, the, the, the story, which I didn't hear at the time, um, was that they'd actually taken on another writer. Um, they'd accepted a concept. They'd received the script. And somewhere along the line, somebody high up in DC had decided that although it was a good script, it wasn't a good vehicle for the character. Um, and so they paid this other writer off and they wanted somebody else to step in a very, very short notice. And Elisa uh, picked up, I, I, I did a book called Dr. Faustus with Caliber, Caliber with Mike Perkins. Um, and Elisa picked it up off the slush pile and it just refreshed her memory. And she remembered the conversations we'd had the year before or a couple of years before. And she called me up and uh, invited me to submit. I sent in the pitch for what became the Morningstar option. They sent it on to Neil. Neil liked it, Karen Berger liked it and they they took me on um it was a just the most incredible thing because at that time my head was absolutely full of the same man. um i thought it was the best i mean certainly the best mainstream comic uh, on sale at the time maybe arguably the best comic on sale at the time because what gaiman did in the same man was he, he completely reinvented the format for long-form storytelling in comics um alan moore had sort of um I think in, in Swamp Thing had sort of been uh, building up to this kind of novelistic approach to comic book storytelling and game and perfects it. You know, in the Sandman, you have effectively um, a single story told over 75 episodes um, and the, the plots and themes and characters weave in and out. He alternates long stories, long arcs with single, single issues, but they all, they all turn out to be relevant. They all pay off at the end. Um, it was just virtuoso stuff, and the chance to sort of work in that in that sandbox was um, just just uh, incredible. I, could, I couldn't believe it was happening. I, th I think that's a great lesson for writers too. That the nose that you got earlier from DC uh, were stepping stones to a yes when it really really mattered. You know. Yeah, I. I, I I spent an awful lot of time like um, pitching things that didn't that didn't go anywhere and feeling like I was either standing still or going backwards. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, none of that time is wasted right. because you're you're learning the process through all of those iterations. You're getting to understand how the industry works, and you're 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 honing your own skills. Uh, and you know, pitching is a skill, uh, which is quite different from the skills that the storytelling skills that you use when you're actually writing the book. Um, and I, I was, yeah, I, I was finding my way. It took a long time. It probably didn't have to take as long as it did. I was too tentative at first. Um, I never had any sort of confidence in myself. So I, I would sort of, um, I would go in feeling like I was going to fail, um, which is probably why it took seven or eight years. But, um, but yeah, not, none of that time was wasted. It was, it was, it was all good stuff. Yeah, at the same time, I, I don't I know absolutely nothing about what you said to Alicia, what she said back to you during all these rejections. But 
obviously you were handling it right. You were building a relationship there because when yeah. they needed someone to pitch them something quickly, you were the person that she thought of. So, you know, building relationships is, is pretty important too. But that said, yeah. let me turn it over to Ben here. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, one thing I wanted to touch on that you mentioned is that Alan Moore had kind of started this idea of long form storytelling in comics um, with Swamp Thing. And Neil Gaiman got a lot of his start from pitching to write Swamp Thing after that. And then you sort of got your big break from, from there. So it's almost like you're in this chain that goes all the way back to, I guess, what would be the early 80s. Um, yeah. Regarding, and kind of the same universe even, where uh, it's all technically DC. You've got Swamp Thing showing up in Sandman. And um, I think that's kind of, uh, that must have been quite a challenge at first, uh, that kind of, um, hereditary background, I guess, behind it? Um, yeah, it, it, it was a huge challenge. I guess I, guess I, was, too, I was too exhilarated and excited to be as afraid as I, as I should have been. <laughs> um, I, I, I was high as a kite on adrenaline a lot of the time. But yeah, I, I, think, I think that is one of the wonderful things about Vertigo, that um, there is um, a family tree, really. That, that there's a... Um, uh, all, all, of, all of the sort of great Vertigo titles share DNA. Um, maybe not all, but an awful lot of them do. Um, obviously, um, Constantine first appears as a character in Swamp Thing, and when um, Neil starts to write um, Sam then he brings Constantine in. And initially, yeah, it was part of the regular DCU, so you'd get appearances like, um, well, Batman, Famously in Swamp Thing, yeah, there's the, the, that whole um, story arc in which um, the Swamp Thing comes to Gotham City because Abby is on trail on trial for um, basically for bestiality for having sex with a tree, <laughs> um, and then Swamp Thing comes and like storms the courthouse, and Batman lets him get away with it because basically um, he recognizes that Swamp Thing has a point, but then he says at the end, you know, don't ever come back to my city. Um, that, 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 that was an amazing time when, you know, when the DCU and the Vertigo universe actually were, were allowed to, to coexist. I guess, we're, I guess we're back there now because Hellblazer, you know, Constantine is, is now a DCU character and Swamp Thing has been in the DCU and so on. Um, it, it, it was, I, I, I guess, my success, um, you know, my, my, my sort of being able to get my foot in the door in American comic books owed an enormous amount to the fact that you know, Neil, you know, Alan had been there, Neil had been there, Grant Morrison had been there. There was a period, there's a magic um, window of time when American editors thought that the British Isles was full of Alan Moores, that all they had to do was come over here with a big net um, and, and scoop up um, half a dozen more um, writers and then they would all be like Alan. Um, so there was, there, was, there, was a, there was a myth, wasn't it, that, that um, during that first British invasion, that the Brits had something, the Brits had some kind, of, um, some kind of formula for American comic books that nobody else had. Uh, and it wasn't true, I don't think. It, what was true was that Alan was doing things, crazy things that no one had done. And then Neil picks up the ball and runs with it. And then a whole bunch of other younger British writers pick up the ball and run with it. Um, so yeah, the similarities were because um, is it is it Thomas Kuhn who says that um, science works by revolutions? It's not it's not about standing on the shoulders of giants. It's about somebody coming along with a new a new template, and then everybody saying that's the way to do it. And you know, for for, for us, it was uh, it was Alan and Neil who created that template. I think part of what's interesting as well is there was an intended follow-up. You mentioned the dreaming, and nowadays most people don't remember the dreaming ever existed. Um, I think it ran for 60 issues or so. I don't, I don't really remember. I was in high school at the time, and uh, it was really Lucifer when it came along. It, it, it kind of took that spot, that place. Um, some of the ideas you introduced in there and kind of that, um, the idea of that kind of mythology in, in Vertigo really took hold. I, th I think um, so. The dreaming starts out as a um, as an anthology book, and then at a certain point, maybe about a year in or, or a couple of years in, they decided to make it into a, a continuity book with Caitlin Keenan 
um, as the as the writer. Um, and Caitlin had to operate under kind of like strict rules right. that kind of kind of sabotaged the entire project. Um, she wasn't allowed to show the endless on panel. Um, I, I, I don't know whose whose idea this was, but that that was definitely the way it worked. So there's, there's, there there is literally there is a an issue of the dreaming in which um, Morpheus um, is 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 hosting a party, and he's off panel the entire time. Um, you've got everybody else sitting around the table, and it's obvious that at the head of the table, Dream is sitting in his throne, but he but you never get to see him. Um, Nobody ever gave me gave me those rules. Nobody ever said to me that I couldn't use the endless. And I, I, in the end, I used pretty much all of the endless. Um, I'm trying to think if there was any. I certainly used destiny. I used death. Um, I used desire and despair. Um, and the the, the the only time Neil ever said no to me was when I wanted to use Rose Walker, um, because he said if he wanted if he was going to come back to Sandman, it was Rose Walker's story that that he would finish. Um, so he, he um, asked me to back off, <laughs> which I think was only reasonable. Um, but the rest of the time, he just gave me you know, carte blanche to uh, to use any of the characters to reference anything that was in continuity. So that, I think Caitlin got a lousy break there. I think the Dreaming could have been a great book, and it kind of wasn't allowed to be. <laughs> right. That wow. That I mean, one of the big things about Sandman were the other endless um, were so popular. I remember Death. There were all these girls getting. Uh, Ankh tattoos and things like that. Everyone was so excited by the character. So that, well, I guess there's a lot we could say about uh, various DC editorships over the years, but uh, um, at least they gave you the opportunity to, to take the ball and run with it, and especially Neil, because that, those cameo, I don't want to say cameos, those guest appearances by the Endless, they weren't necessarily critical to getting your book going, but they really helped kind of that idea that this was all connected, that going all the way back to Lucifer's appearance in Sandman. It wasn't a new character. Yeah, it, it made the book feel like an actual sequel uh, rather, rather than just um, you know, a, a, a spin-off, I guess, in some ways. Um, while we're talking about Vertigo editors, I, the other thing I should say is I, I was incredibly lucky uh, with my collaborators at Vertigo right, right from the start. So my first ever Vertigo book was, um, was that uh, Lucifer miniseries. Um, I was working with Elisa Whitney, who um, has, has got to be one of the best editors in the business. I mean, she kind of doesn't do it anymore. She writes um, herself. Um, but, but I learned so much about comic storytelling from working with her. And then um, when she left, she went away on maternity leave. Um, Shelley Bond, uh, or Shelley Roberg, as she was then, um, picked me up. And again, uh, it was just an incredibly, incredibly fruitful relationship because she was an editor who cared deeply about story and was very detail oriented. She would pick a fight with you. Like she would ask um, for a complete breakdown of the issue. And if she thought that you'd given three pages to a scene that you could do in two, she would tell you that. Um, you know, she would actually sort of be picking apart the structure and making sure that it was all fit for purpose. Um, so we had you know, some really, really great arguments about how the story should articulate. No, that's. Uh, I think it was Stephen King that said that if it wasn't for his editors, he wouldn't have ever been a best-selling author. Um, I can. I think most writers could say that over time. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of examples where the editor backs off, and you can look at the work that was done on a comic run or something and kind of wonder what happened there. Yeah. Um, one other question I had about uh, Lucifer was um, the. I guess you would call it the cosmology behind it. It wasn't. You, I get you're technically using Judeo-Christian characters. But you went in a completely different direction with it. It was not a um, this this wasn't necessarily like a Christian Lucifer and, and Yahweh and every, and and everything. It was kind of a, sort of a different background. I know some of that was Neil with the Silver City idea, but um, where did you get some of that and, and kind of the direction you ended up taking the series? Um, that's a that's a very good point to raise. Actually, I mean uh, the, the most obvious um, deviation between our story and the traditional um, Judeo-Christian um, account um, of the fall of Lucifer is basically we we steered very very clear of um, of Christ. We 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 never never reference Christ at all. Um, instead, we have a story in which um, God effectively has three sons, 
Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. Um, and all three of them are um, instrumental in uh, furnishing, uh, creating and furnishing the, the universe that is, that, you know, that is um, God's creation. Um, they, they are the ones who kind of um, have the executive power over, over the shape and structure of the universe. Um, and, the, and the story eventually becomes kind of, a, um, among other things, a, a family story, a story about um, parent-child relationships. Um, I think I think the biggest influences on my writing were Milton and Blake, and of the two, Blake much more than Milton. Um, you know, Mil Milton in Paradise Lost, basically, you know, he 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 sort of embellishes the whole story of the uh, the war in heaven and turns it into this this colossal cosmic epic, um, which is inspired, you know, m most most sort of um, accounts of the fall since then. Um, but Blake does something entirely different. Blake almost ignores good and evil in his account of um, of Satan's rebellion and makes it be about um, will and control. Um, so he has Eurism as the aspect of God that says no, the aspect of God that tries to deny, to control, to limit. And then he has um, Satan, um, the adversary, as basically the power that stands up and says, I will not be contained, I will not be controlled. Um, so if God is control, Satan is energy, and as Blake puts it, energy is eternal delight. Um, Blake basically feels that as a, as a poet, as a creator, as a visionary, you have to be on the devil's side because the devil um, is, is the incarnation of, of will, of will and desire. And, and I think my Lucifer, uh, so the, the, my, my, my take on Neil's Lucifer is, is an incarnation of, of will and desire as well. He's, he's somebody who, um, he's, he's not evil for the sake of evil. Uh, he, he, doesn't, he, doesn't, um, he doesn't hurt people because he takes any pleasure in it. It's just that he's so focused on his own needs that he will trample over you to get something done. Yeah, he, would, he would literally um, set fire to the entire universe to light his cigarette. Um, he doesn't see or acknowledge other people's needs or other people's selfhood because he is so um, monomaniacally focused on himself. Ben, can I jump in with a quick question about Lucifer? Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, uh, Neil wrote a short story called Murder Mysteries. Um, don't know if you've read that one or not yet. Did they... Was it was did they turn it into a comic at some point? Was it done in prose yeah, and then they did? Yeah. They also turned it into an audio drama, which was very very well done. Uh, Brian Dennehy uh, played the main character in it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I this may be something you can't answer if you've not gotten around to reading that yet. But uh, Lucifer is one of the characters in that story. You know, it's called the Silver City. Uh, it's about a murder that happens before before creation um and i just wondering can't help but wonder is this the same lucifer in sandman is this is this the same lucifer that you're writing about you know so hmm. i'm sorry no i i i, I can't answer that one Mike. Yeah. um it, w it would it would it would surprise me if neil had not deliberately made that correspondence because he loves to do things like that he loves to to, to see things in one story and then pay them off in another I, I, one one of the the extraordinary things about Sandman was well, first of all, the kind of meta mythology, the way he, he creates um, his own mythology, which subsumes all the mythologies and religions of Earth. So he creates a stage on which um, angels can talk to um, Native American tribal deities and Japanese storm gods, and it all makes perfect sense. Um, and I think within that. He does something even cleverer, which is he he refuses to privilege one belief system over another. Yes, okay, this is a universe that was created by Yahweh, um, and Yahweh is the most uh, powerful being in it, and Lucifer is um, explicitly um, defined as the second most powerful being in it, even more powerful than the Endless. But that's only true now. It won't necessarily be true tomorrow, and it wasn't necessarily true yesterday. Everything is mutable because behind all of the gods, the ultimate creative power is the human imagination. There is an issue of Sandman called Dream of a Thousand Cats, 
in which he shows how that mechanic works. If enough people, if enough human beings or enough sentient beings believe something, then that becomes the truth. That becomes the truth under which the universe operates. If their beliefs change, those fundamental mental truths shift along with the belief. Well, it, it's one of my favorite short stories. So if and when you get around to reading that, Murder Mysteries by Neil Gaiman, for those who haven't read it, um, shoot me an email. Please tell me what you think, if this is the same Lucifer, because oh. I'm, I'm very much interested in, in knowing that. Uh, okay. Mike, for, where can that story be found? Sorry, I might have missed it. But I it's, I don't know which Neil Gaiman collection it's in. You'd have to Google that. Um, I can tell you this. It was turned into a graphic novel, and I thought that was okay, but as you guys know, I'm a big fan of audio drama. Uh, probably only the thousandth time I've said this on that show. I've been listening to audio dramas, old-time radio, and, and newer stuff for 40 years. And that's the, the, the audio dramatization of uh, Murder Mysteries is probably in the top 10 of anything I've ever heard. So uh, if you can if you can find that and listen to it, I would. <laughs> it, Neil Gaiman's a phenomenal writer, uh, but I would almost say listen to the audio drama first. It's so good. But uh, failing that, yes, definitely read that short story. So, and you can find that short story in his Smoke and Mirrors collection. Oh, thank you, Ben. Yeah. So um, it, anyway, that's all I had. Oh, good. I have that book. I'll I'll check it out. Yeah. Um, so to, I guess to finish up with Lucifer, um, I know that you had nothing to do with the TV series and your series had nothing to do with the, um, I, I mean, they used ideas from Sandman and created a cop drama called Lucifer with a character that was called Lucifer. I don't, I don't know how else to connect it to. I think they may have used your name as a character name at one point. That's right. I, I, I died hideously. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it seems strange. So they don't, I don't even know. If they uh, if they credited you at all at any point because it's not technically based on your series, but it felt it felt like they wouldn't have made it if your series hadn't been kind of the critically acclaimed work it was. Um, um, yeah, I, I I I think I think all all adaptation is is reinvention. Um, and you know Neil, Neil has said uh, on on many occasions when he's been talking about this about um, other people picking up. The reins, you know, picking up characters um, that he's created and doing different things with them. Um, he says, "Yeah, that that that's how it is. You, you when you finish playing with the toys, you put them back in the box, neatly and tidily, so that other people can come along and and play with them later." Um, and and he was, yeah, you know, he was always incredibly generous and supportive um, of of everything that I tried to do in Lucifer. Um, when I, when I when I've looked at the TV series, I, I guess I've seen it as something that was inspired by Sandman and to some extent Lucifer in the same way that um, you know, my, my Lucifer was inspired by Sandman and um, the, 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 the various takes on it since. Holly Black's Lucifer was inspired both by Neil's stories and mine, um, which is kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of cool that that happens. You know, the, 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 um, the, the the characters get keep on getting reinvented, keep on be, being used for different purposes. Um, if if you look at my book, um, just just uh, in itself, uh, apart apart from its uh, its huge debt to Sandman, what I end up doing with it is is like scratching some itches that were just mine. I, I, I it's all overwhelmingly about um, free will and predestination, and about parent child relationships, about the extent to which our parents kind of make us what we are and the extent to which you can ever free yourself of those childhood influences. Um, and I think that's different from what Neil was doing in his book. It's, 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 it's close enough that my, I, ho I hope my Lucifer doesn't feel like, um, you know, it doesn't feel like I, I've, um, I've ignored the continuity, but I definitely took it in my own direction and Holly took it in her own direction. I think Dan Watters now in the new book is doing something completely different again. Um, I love that. I love that about comics, especially about you know, it's, it's it's specifically the American market that does that, that that um, that has these these ongoing series that last far longer than any creators um, run on them. Um, so you get characters that decade after decade, generation after generation, keep getting reused and reinvented. 
I think I think comics I mean, are unique in that respect. I, I would agree. I wouldn't say it's only America at this point. Uh, UK does have Judge Dredd, for example, which I think is 40-ish years now. Um, yeah. I think and did they just a put a new of... writer on Asterix or something? I, I think that the, the French book Asterix now has a new creative team on it. Yeah. And, uh, but I agree with you. I think that's wonderful. It gives us... Um, I have a gigantic Batman trade paperback collection and I can't count how many different incarnations. There's a 60s show and all the way to the Frank Miller stuff. It's It can be so different from itself and yet you still see Batman in it and, and kind of it's true to that, that source. That's, so what gets me, that's what gets me when people complain about a particular Batman movie or whatever. They're like, that's not the real Batman. Yeah, there is no real Batman. There's a million different takes on Batman. <laughs> So it's a run. Batman isn't real. Uh, oh, sorry, Matt. Um, I've got some bad news on the Easter Bunny, but I'll tell you about that later. So there was a great uh, there was a great radio debate on Radio Four over here on our, on our public radio um, network. Uh, it was when the Disney movie Hercules came out. They got a guy from Oxford. They got they got a classical scholar from Oxford onto the program thinking that he was going to like completely trash the movie. They said, so what about this, this take on, on Hercules? Uh, how canonical is it? And the guy said, well, the, what do you mean by canonical? You know, the, the Hercules was a character who was constantly um, used for different purposes at different stages of, um, of, of Greek civilization. Um, this, this, this feels like a pretty cool take to me. Uh, he just flat, flatly refused to, uh, to, to trash Disney. That's great. <laughs> So, so um, to kind of, I guess, shift into another topic before we get into the girl with all the gifts, um, one thing I've noticed is a lot of your work is, um, I don't want to call it horror-based, but supernatural-based. So you have the Felix Castor novels, which um, I have very fond memories of. Um, there's a lot of your other comic book works, such as Hellblazer. Um, what kind of got you interested in that and going that direction? I, you've been very, you were very successful with X-Men, for example, but this is what seems to stand out to me. Yeah, um, I, I honestly don't know. Um, I, 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 I don't think I can give a, a full answer to that question. It's just always, always been there for me. I think probably fantasy more than horror. And probably it goes back to the very, very first stories that I was introduced to as a kid. Um, there's a British writer, Ina Blyton, who is probably best known for um, stories of childhood adventure, the famous five and the secret seven. Um, but she also did some amazing fantasy. She did a series of books called The, um, the Fabulous Far Away Tree. And she did a series of books called The Magic Wishing Chair. Um, and they, they were really, really simply told. She wasn't a great stylist, um, but they, they were just full of great ideas. The Far Away Tree was a tree that had a different world at the top every day. And these kids would climb up and discover these different worlds and have adventures in them. Um, but if you stayed too long, um, then, the, the, the world would revolve, and then you wouldn't be at the top of the tree anymore, and you'd have to wait for a whole year to come back down into the world. Um, and I, I read those when I was, well, I had them read to me when I was three years old, and I think I got the fantasy bug from there. There were also some great British um, comics for kids, like, like um, humor comics for kids, and they were basically, a lot of the stories in those were fantasy-based. There was a series by Ken Reed, um, called Frankie Stein, which is about a, um, a scientist who creates a monster. And the mon he creates the monster as, a, as a, a playmate for his son because he can't be bothered playing with his son himself. And the monster and the son have, have crazy adventures together. Um, so I, th I think I, 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 was always, I was always kind of like um, sold on fantasy from a very young age. And, and at a certain point, I stopped reading anything that wasn't fantasy or sci-fi or horror. Um, I started again in my teens, but um, I can't. I can't write in a realist mode. I tried. I tried. I did a couple of um, like mainstream thrillers, um, maybe ten years ago, and I felt like I was. I felt like I was cross dressing. I felt. I felt like it, it just. It just completely went against the grain for me. Um, actually, that's a bad metaphor. It's probably closer to the truth to say I felt like I was trying to paint, and the only color I had on my brush was white. Um, I, th I think fantasy and speculative fiction, that whole, that whole sort of um, spectrum that runs from sci-fi through fantasy to horror to magical realism, 
that just feels like a, a rich palette to me. And I don't think I can write without those 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 colors, those 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 tones. Well, and I think uh, that'll take us to the next thing: the girl with all the gifts. Um, I wouldn't say science fiction is quite accurate, but I think speculative fiction works because you're using sort of kind of realistic concepts behind it, and it's, um, and then you kind of went. I don't want to say. Uh, I guess post-apocalyptic would be the right word. It's sort of it's yeah. several years after the disease is spread, and and I thought that was um, was part of the fun. I just want to say something that one thing I loved about the idea was you took a real biological concept and you tinkered with it just a little bit. I mean, I, I really find it fascinating and so creative when authors do this, like Peter Watts with Starfish, fiddling around yes. with. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Of bacteria, you know, and then so all you did was fiddle around with a real biological concept. And I was wondering, what what was your inspiration? It was just so cool. Well, the the it it's it's kind of um, it's an example of being forced out of your comfort zone um, because I, I was invited to submit a story for an anthology. Um, Girl with all gifts started out as a short story called Iphigenia and Alice. Um, Charlene Harris and Tony Kellner used to do these themed anthologies. And the theme was always something really um, comfortingly banal and every day, uh, like family vacations or um, home improvement. And the brief was write a horror story or a supernatural story or a dark fantasy story um, based around that theme. And I said I would do a story and the theme for that year was school days. And I just sat there staring at the wall for a long time. I couldn't think of a, a single decent idea. And then the idea I came up with was Melanie, uh, a young girl sitting in a classroom writing an essay. And the essay is what I want to be when I grow up. But she's a zombie, so she's never going to grow up. That was, the, that was the sort of starting point of the story. And in the short story, I just said, oh, it's a virus, uh, yeah, the, the thing that causes Zombie, the, the zombie plague is a virus. It's a, it's a viral pathogen. Um, and then having sent the story in, um, I thought I couldn't put the character down. I couldn't put the voice down. I really, I really enjoyed writing her. So um, I tried to turn it into a novel. And as soon as I did that, I thought, well, that virus thing is going to fly. I need something more robust than that because um, the search for a cure is such an important part of the story. I needed to make sure that the explanation was was robust, would stand up to scrutiny. And so I literally went shopping for a pathogen. Um, I, I, I actually um, remembered having seen the um, that incredible footage from the David Attenborough documentary of ants, incept uh, ants infected with cordyceps, fungal, the fungal mycelia sprouting out of the ants' head. Um, and so I went back and I watched the documentary again, and then I found a, an amazing book about parasitic life forms called Parasite Rex um, by, I think, Roy Salter. Um, and I thought, yeah, that's, that's the pathogen for me. And I built it into the story, um, and it, it, it just kept on giving. <laughs> no. yeah, so, that was well, let me jump in with this. How Wait. cool was it when you found out Glenn Close was going to? I couldn't. Film. Yeah, I just couldn't believe. I couldn't believe that. Um, it, it was Cami. It was it was Cami Gatan, the um, the lead producer, who basically just said, "Yeah, if you don't ask, you don't get." Um, and she 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 yes, sent it out to Glenn, to Glenn's agent, and Glenn Glenn said afterwards she read the first ten pages and thought, "Yeah, I'm I'm going to do this." It was a it was a fantastic moment. Um, I, I'm I'm still ecstatic whenever I whenever I see the film because you know, the casting was. Was pretty near perfect. You know, you got Glenn as Caldwell, Gemma Arterton as Justin, you know, Patty Considine as Parks, Viseo as Gallagher, and um, Senya, who was an absolute unknown at the time, playing Melanie. That was her first feature role. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's a, it's a it's a crazy thing to ask a twelve year old girl to do. Yeah, there's going to be a movie, a ninety minute movie. You're going to be on screen for all of those ninety minutes, and basically. Everybody else's performance revolves around yours. No pressure. She did so well. Great yeah. actress. She was amazing. Um, the, the, there was also, she had a body double, um, Mia Garcia, 
So whenever you see Senya from behind, it's actually Mia. And they were, they were both really good. <laughs> ben, you have some more questions? Yeah. Um, so I was going to ask, um, you got to write the screenplay for that. And uh, what was that kind of process like and, and being able to adapt your own work and have it kind of show up so faithfully on the screen? Um, it was amazing. But actually, it was crazier than that because um, what happened was I wrote the short story, um, as previously described. And then I, 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 I wanted, I desperately wanted to write the novel. So I went to my publishers and tried to persuade them to get to let me out of the contract I was in because I owed them another mainstream thriller, another Dan Brown conspiracy thriller. So I was saying, you yeah, know, please tear the contract up because I want to write this. And they weren't, they weren't easy to convince because the contract, there was a third party to the contract, which was my, my agency. Um, and my agent at that time, Meg, had left the agency, um, MBA, to start her own agency, Key. So the contract was now with a, an agency that I had no direct connection to. And so as part of that negotiation, I had to go back to MBA and say, could you please let me out of this contract under which you would get money so that I can sign another contract under which you will get another penny? Would that be OK? And it was, a, it was an awkward it was an awkward situation. And at the same time, but eventually, eventually they said yes. And at the same time, I met Cammy and I pitched the idea for the screenplay. So I was writing the novel and the screenplay side by side. They were both kind of adaptations of the short story. Um, and for a year, year and a half, I was just living in that story world. I was writing the novel. I was writing drafts of the screenplay. I was going backwards and forwards between the two different versions of the story. And somehow, each of them made the other easier. It was like trying to solve the problem for one, one, one version, clarify what I was doing in the other. and. Um, it felt almost effortless. It felt like the story was growing by itself rather than I was writing it. Yeah, I, I had read that you wrote them both at the same time when I was going to ask you if that was accurate. So, yeah, and it made it easier, you say. The, um, the screenwriting went on longer. Movies have longer gestation periods than novels do, by and large. Um, so the, the novel came out in January 2014, and I was still working on the screenplay for another year and a half after that. And some of the later scenes in the film, I think, were my second and better thoughts, particularly um, the final scene between Melanie and Caldwell. In the novel, Caldwell basically dies when she doesn't have a plot function anymore. Um, she just turns around and keels over, and that's her done. Um, in the movie... Melanie forces Caldwell to admit that she's human. And, and, and that basically, that, that's what the story is called. Well, you know, the fact that she dies afterwards is almost irrelevant. She's just been forced to admit that she spent 10 years of her life dissecting children, that these kids are real. They're not, they're not fungal colonies. They're individuals. Um, and I think that's a much better, a much better end point for Caldwell's art. Yeah. And she, by her own admission, had wrestled with this question for years. And uh, when Justin, oh, am I getting that name right? Talks to her about it. She says that, you know, I've gone over this and gone over this. And, you yeah. know, and then for at the end to her to admit, uh, I think the words were, you know, yes, you are alive. Um, yeah, that has a lot of impact. So. And, and some of that was because at that stage, I knew that Glenn Close was going to be saying those lines. And I was imagining her saying them, you know, I was, I was putting her into that scene. Yeah. Which was a very fruitful thing to do. Uh, Kelly, you have a question. Yeah, two actually. Um, Mike, you said that you wrote under a bunch of different pseudonyms with the success of Girl, on, Girl with All the Gifts and then the success of the movie. Does everybody want you to write under M.R. Carey now? Um, yeah, they do. Uh, I can't. Mike Carey can't get a look in. It's kind of annoying. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 I would love to write the sixth cast novel at some point, but it's been difficult to uh, to do that because um, Little Brown have a very very strong sense of what M.R. Carey writes, and if I pitch something that's too Mike Carey to them, they <laughs> um, they, they, they 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 tend to sort of steer me in another direction. That's too bad because so, yeah, I've been uh, years for that novel. Sorry? 
I said, it's too bad. I've been waiting 10 years for this novel. <laughs> it, it will come, Ben, honestly, it will come. Um, I think it may be soon. I've had it plotted since forever. I, I, I came close to writing it about seven years ago, and then other things happened and got in the way, but it will happen. I swear to God. Well, then you, you ended up following Girl with All the Gifts with uh, Boy on the Bridge, so you dipped back into the world again. Are we going to see a film adaptation of that, maybe? Probably not. Um, so Cammy's Cammy's company, um, Poison Chef, has the rights. Um, and we talked about a second movie. Um, then we started working on a second, second movie, but it's not bad. We started working on a different project together. Um, and we're still, we're still, we were quite a long way along with that other project. But if there was going to be a movie of Boy, it couldn't happen until, we, until we've got that other thing done. Um, I, I wouldn't rule it out, but at the moment, it's, it's, it's looking like a remote prospect. Um, but I'm definitely um, doing more work with that production company and with some of those people. And then finally, are you interested in dipping back into that world in fiction again? Yes. Yes, I am. Um, but I don't think there's going to be a third novel because um, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't got a, a compelling framework for a third novel. But there's a couple of things that I would like to do that might make decent short stories. I would like to tell the outbreak story. I'd like to, to tell the story of how Cordyceps got out into the population in the first place. And I would like to tell a story about Melanie post Girl with All the Gifts, about the early stages of what happened next. Oh, I would like to read that. <laughs> Ke Kelly has been after me, had, had been after me for months to uh, watch The Girl with All the Gifts because I kept telling him how sick I was of zombies and zombie movies and everything. And he's like, no, this is different. You got to watch this. And uh, as much as I hate to agree with Kelly Young, he was right. So, Holy cow, you guys. We got this in public on the air. This will yeah, last this, forever. This being recorded, he's going to edit it out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to replay this at the beginning of every podcast. Well, well, is there any way you would do this, like, say, tell one of these stories in graphic novel format? Considering your experience in comics, this might make a good story that way, maybe. I, I, I would love to do that. And um, at one point, um, I, I, I approached Cammy when we were working on the film and said, Would, wouldn't a comic version be a cool way of trailing the film? And she said no. Um, she was worried about not being in control of the timing. Um, she, she just felt that if we were going to do a comic, it should wait until after the film was out. So the film could speak for itself, and she could sort of be totally in control of the promotion for it, and so on. Um, but I would love to. I yeah, would love to do a girl with all the gifts comic. I would love to do a girl with all the gifts comic with uh, Mike Perkins doing the art. I think that'd be an awesome thing. It's it's probably it's it's a harder sell because these days um, most comic book companies are looking for properties where they can control the ancillary rights. Yeah, you know, where if there's going to be a, a TV version or a movie version they are um, production partners. So it's, it's harder to sell adaptations of things that are already out there, unless they were kind of like um, massively bestsellers. Uh, Philip, I know you had some questions as well. Well, most of my questions have already gone through the mix. <coughs> I was gonna, I was gonna ask about, hey Mike, I'm Philip, by the way. I I'm a big fan. I've read uh, I've read the uh, two of the caster books, and I've read the girls girls all the gifts books and fell side, and uh, so I'm a, a big fan of your novels. Um, and no, I was going to ask about the short story because I think I first read the short story. Um, I don't know if it was I don't know if it was under the same title, but I was that in a best of collection? Either it Alan Datlow's. I think that's where I first read it. Was in Alan Datlow's Best of Horror. Yep. Um, and before that, it was in um, a collection called An Apple for the Creature. But the, yeah, then it was then it was in the best of. Yeah. yeah, so that's where I discovered your your work for the first time, and then I started reading the Caster novels, and the Girl with All the Gifts book came out, and it was really exciting for me. So, um, no, I'm just a big fan. I hope that they do something um, that you do something with the Caster novels in other media. Uh, I could see it being a 
a series or Exorcist Hunter series would be kind of fun. We we we've tried. We've um we've sold the rights, we've sold the option um, several times over. Um, but I am currently working on um, a caster series um, with some people who seem to be really committed to it. So I have hopes. This is one reason why I think the sixth novel might eventually happen because I think if we could get a TV series going, there would be right. a really strong argument to um, to polish up the, uh, the 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 books and, and get them back out again. Right, and I was wondering, are you, when, I, when you were talking about writing the novel and the screenplay simultaneously, because I, I've, I've, you know, I write screenplays as well, and 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 dabble in the writing that side of things, but I find it incredibly difficult to do both anywhere near each other because they're such different style from a stylistic perspective. As a writer, yeah. it's very hard for me to be like, well, wait, now I'm writing in the screenplay mode, so I'm not doing any any of the pros or any of the you know flourishes that I would normally do. And I'm just kind of action, dialogue, action, dialogue. And it's kind of hard for me to go back and forth. So I was very impressed that you were able to do both sort of at the same time. I would think that'd be very difficult. I think no, normally it is, yeah. Um, and and it's taken me a hell of a long time to, to get any kind of um, handle on screenwriting. I think what I did when I, first, when I started out, I wrote comic scripts and pretended they were screenplays. Right, um, because I knew how to do comic scripts, um, but the differences are, are huge, um, and I, I only got away with it because I was working for I was working on these very low budget um, European animations, uh, and no, 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 nobody, nobody cared enough to to tell me what I was doing wrong. Right, um, but Girl with All the Gifts, I think, was the first screenplay I wrote that really worked like a screenplay. And I think again, it was because I was working with. I was just lucky that I was working with um, with really good people, um, and yeah, you know, it, it took shape in a, in, a, in, a, in a very organic way. But yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I think shifting between the different different modes of storytelling, it's always hard and it's always slow. Um, yeah. I, I find that um, I need I need kind of a, a day as an airlock between any two, any two projects that are not in the same media. Um, Particularly if I've been working on a novel and I break off to do a comic script or to, to work on a screenplay, getting back to the novel needs at least a day. And I do it by rereading the whole thing, all of the work in progress, and then wow. starting to starting to write in a sort of very, very loose and freeform way until I get the voice right again. Um, but you do get you do get a kind of mental interference, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I've been I've lately I've been adapting some of my screenplays to to stories and novellas and novels because I, it's been an interesting process. It's actually just having like a very robust outline. You just kind of kind of follow the framework and and the action. Yeah, but it's kind of handy. So uh, I'm it's I'm sure it's a, been a blast to adapt your own work to to screen. Now that you're doing more of it, I know, I know how fun it is to kind of take those scenes and those characters and flush them out in a different way. And, and to um, to find other other sort of paths through the story, I mean, right. the, the the lovely thing the lovely thing about adaptation is you you can you can add stuff in, um, you you can sort of explore different different bits of the world. I, mean, I guess that's where um, that's where Boy on the Bridge started from. It was from an awareness that there were bits of Melanie's story that we didn't tell because there wasn't time. Um, you know, the, in Girl with All the Gifts, they find there's a moment when they find this massive tank, Rosie abandoned on the streets of London and it's like the Marie Celeste. What what happened to the crew? Um how did it get there with one dead body in the um in the in the cockpit? Right. And I thought I thought that would be a cool story to tell if I could use it to kind of um to come into Melanie's story from a different angle so that you felt like you were rediscovering that world. And I I, I love that. I love that when I, yeah it's, it's, again it's another thing that I love about Amer the American comic industry. That, that that sort of thing happens all the time that people will pick up a tiny piece of the backstory for a character and suddenly turn it into you know bringing it into the foreground right did i read somewhere that you did x-men as well or, or am i thinking of someone else mike i, I did x-men for um about five years yeah for it was um it started out as um adjectiveless x-men you know the, the, the x-men that didn't have amazing or uncanny uh, in front of it. And then it became X-Men Legacy. And I, I, had, I had tons of fun with those books. Um, 
I can remember the first Marvel comic book that I read as a kid. It was a Fantastic Four annual, and it was a gift for my older brother. Um, it was the, the annual in which Reed Richards is trapped in the negative zone, and Triton is sent in to rescue him. Um, so it was Stanley, Jack Kirby, and I, I read this, and I was, I was immediately um, like just drawn into that world. Um, and I've never left it, really. And there's something special about adding chapters to a story that you read as a child, you know, go, going into a fictional world that you inhabited at, at, as a young age when you were still, um, you know, impressionable, I guess. When, you, for, for a kid, your imaginative landscape is as real to you as the real world is. And then sort of going back as an adult and, and being, being allowed to play with those characters is, is a really special experience which I've just described in a really inarticulate way. <laughs> no, I, I get what you mean. Um, what You have a book coming out soon, right? Could you tell us about that? I do, yeah, next week, in fact. Um, I think next Tuesday is, is, the, um, is the American publication date. Okay. It's, called, it's called Someone Like Me. It's freestanding. It's not a, it's not a series um, or a sequel to anything. Uh, and it's a story about... I guess you could call it a story about possession. The lead character is a, um, a wife and mother. Actually, she's an ex-wife. She's separated from her husband. Um, she's bringing up two kids by herself. But the husband is still in her life because he still has, has visitation rights. Um, and he's, he's violently abusive. Um, whenever they meet up, he is threatening to her, and sometimes he's physically abusive to her. Um, and the story starts with him... Um, assaulting her and out of nowhere she's suddenly she's suddenly gifted with an incredible amount of strength and willpower and she doesn't know where it comes from she's able to fight him off she's able to to wound him and to hold him off until the police get there um but she doesn't know where this strength came from and she doesn't understand what it is and then she keeps on being visited by this other version of herself she keeps on um suddenly having this other set of of behaviors and, and um, instincts and it becomes more and the other side of her becomes more and more violent and more and more dominant um, and until she decides basically she has to figure out what it is and she has to get rid of it so it's kind of a Jekyll and Hyde story but um, it goes off in a, in, a, in a different direction and the explanation for what's happening is not what you might expect it to be. Uh, you're right it's Tuesday I just pulled it up under MR Carey uh, and um, uh, comes out on Tuesday, and I'll point out again to the listeners that uh, pre-orders, if, you, if you're planning on waiting until Tuesday to get it, you know you want it, but you're going to wait till it comes out. It's it's better to pre-order. It's always better for the for the writer and for the publisher. So uh, pre-ordered if it looks like something that that you'd want to read. Uh, looks like it's also, also Christmas is coming up, so you could buy it as a gift for somebody. That's right. That's right. Holiday. Like multiple copies. Uh, looks like it's also going to be available at uh, audible.com as well. So that's great. Um, I, I noticed at the at the bottom here they uh, say for more from Mr. Carey, check out. Then they list three books, and then they say by the same author writing as Mike Carey. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, my, my anyway. middle name, my middle name, by the way, my middle name is James. So the uh, the R in MR Carey doesn't stand for anything. Um, the the, um, the the British proofs of Girl with All the Gifts were actually by M J Carey, and on the day that they came out, um, we discovered there was already an M J Carey um, on Goodreads. She writes bondage porn, and she's very <laughs> prolific. Um, so the so my Goodreads page is li linking directly from Girl with All the Gifts to. Daniel's chains, Daniel's dungeon, Daniel, Daniel's um, slaves and secrets and so on. Um, and uh, we thought the girl with all the gifts takes on an unfortunate set of connotations um, in that context. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a good decision to change who they are. <laughs> Philip, yeah. Well, I was just wondering, and I don't mean to put you on the spot with this, Mike, but I another author... Um, recently talked about this uh riley sigler i think it was and they said that their publisher had asked them to use for him to use a uh you know a, a gender free name uh because they didn't want people 
thinking he was male or female. They kind of liked the idea of them not knowing, and they thought it would actually help with sales. He was right. He wrote a thriller. Um, and I was wondering if that had anything to do with the MR using the initials instead of your name. Did they kind of want to let people guess or not, you know, whether or not you were male or female when they're buying the book, hoping that it might generate more sales? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, if that, if that was part of the thinking, they didn't share it with me. Um, I think that the, the, the main idea was just to go for a kind of Ian Banks versus Ian M. Banks kind of vibe so that um, it was similar enough so that people who um, knew my existing writing would make the connection, but different enough so that um, supermarket buyers and chain store buyers would um, would not like necessarily register that this was a, um, a, a change of a change of pace for an existing author. They'd see it as a debut novel and therefore right. they'd, they'd judge it on its own merits and order order what they thought was an appropriate amount instead of checking back to you know what did his previous book sell and let's gotcha. let's let's order let's order eighty percent of that. So sometimes this backfires. There's an anecdote when I was in the service of this person who joined the army and his name was R. J. Jones. Just R. J. He had no the, the initials meant nothing. So on his initial paperwork he wrote R parentheses only J parentheses only Jones and for the next thirty years he's rolling Jolly Jones. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, I don't see how it would matter too much anyway, Philip, because all they got to do is flip to the back flap, and if they care if it's a male or a female, and add to that, I always kind of assumed, unless I know differently, that if I see a MD Davis, for example, that it's there's a high probability of it of being a female author. So. I don't know why that is, but it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It was just I read an interview with this guy, and I'm trying to think of the guy's name. And he wrote a big, he had a big best-selling book last year, but I think his name was. And he changed his name to. They made him change his name to Riley, or they used the name Riley because they didn't want people to know that he was a man. Um, but yeah, John Mantooth went through the same thing where his early books, uh, they. You know, when he came up with his new book that was a thriller, he changed his name to Hank Early because they didn't want booksellers looking up John Mantooth for the exact same reason that Mike was just saying. So it's really fast. I find that part of the business fascinating and sort of terrifying, but it's it's really interesting for sure. Um, and um, the other question I had, Mike, was I was going to ask you what I'm very interested to know what writers you read uh, for both pleasure and as inspiration. I you know I'm curious what what writers you would definitely want people to um, to check out if you could name a couple that you yeah, enjoy. I'd be delighted to. So at the moment, I'm in the middle of two books that I'm loving. Um, one of them is Naomi Novik's um, Spinning Silver. Um, I never read any of her uh, Temeraire books. So the first novel of hers that I read was Uprooted, which I thought was extraordinary. Spinning Silver is even better. Um, and she, she kind of does what Neil does, which is she, um, she takes a, a folktale situation and writes something that's psychologically real and complex around that. Um, in, spinning, in the case of Spinning Silver, it's a, a girl who can spin silver into gold. Um, but the, what, what, she, what she does with that situation is amazing. And the other book I'm reading is Adrian Tchaikovsky's Children of Time which is kind of an uplift story. It's about, it's about um, non-sentient species being raised to, um, to, to uh, sentience and civilization. And that's, that's really awesome. Just wonderful classic sci-fi, beautifully written. And that um, just won a big award, right? I don't know which one. It was the Hugo well, or the Nebula. Clark, it's, yeah. it's certainly one of Clark. It may have won, it may have won something else as well. Yeah. Um, my, 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 my favorite writers, a lot of my favorite writers, Ashley Le Guin, I absolutely love um, and, uh, both our early stuff, you know, the Earthsea novels, the Acumen novels, and some of the later books like Lavinia, uh, I think are incredible. Um, I still love Roger Zelazny, and every, every few years I'll reread the Amber books. Um, oh, gosh, yeah. Fritz, Fritz Leiber's uh, Fafford and the Grey Mouser, um, Mervyn Peake's Gorman Guest trilogy, I love. Um, Tim Powers' early novels, uh, especially Dinner at Deviant's Palace. Um, when, I, when, I, when I first started getting into fantasy for older readers, as opposed to the kiddie fantasy that I used to read at school, um, my first big crush was on Michael Moorcock, the Eternal Champion books. 
um, which, you know, in some ways they're pot boilers. They were 150 pages long. He would write them in maybe three weeks or four weeks. But they were they had some great ideas and they were always a blast to read. And for a long time, when I started to write my own stuff, I thought the quest for a magic artifact was pretty much the only formula for fantasy. I, I wrote, I must have written a dozen books, <laughs> a dozen unpublished books that had that uh, that sort of premise to them. Um, apart from that, I mean, in, in terms of comics, I read um, basically anything that Grant Morrison does, I will pick up. Uh, anything that Neil does, I'll pick up. Although Neil sadly doesn't write that many comics anymore. Um, I like Gail Simone's work. Um, I like uh, who's the guy who did the the recent revamp of Mister Miracle? Mm, I don't know. The latest Mister Miracle miniseries in DC was um, was incredibly cool. My, Tom King, maybe Tom King wrote it, possibly. So those those would be some. Yeah, like, Tom Tom King is the name that popped up. Okay. Well, Philip asked questions I was about to ask, so I just have one. Sorry, left. Um, Mike. Oh, no, you're fine. Le less work for me. Um, you had mentioned, when we did the video test, Mike, you had mentioned, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but something along the lines of doing a collaboration with your wife and or your daughter and how that changed a few things for you. You want to talk yes, about that real right. quick? Uh, in fact, there were two. So um, I, I, we co-wrote two novels together. Um, my wife, Linda, my daughter, Louise, uh, and myself. Uh, the first was an Arabian Nights um, pastiche, and the second was a ghost story set in 18th century Europe. It was a historical novel as well as a ghost story. Um, and we just we did it basically because we just thought it would be fun to try. It was different from anything that any of us had attempted before. Um, and the reason why I mentioned it, uh, Mike, was because those two collaborations happened immediately before Girl With All The Gifts. So for, for two years, two and a half years before I wrote Girl With All The Gifts, I was collaborating with two women who had very strong personalities, very strong voices of their own. Um, and the way collaboration works, I think, well, certainly the way it worked for us is we had to find a style that worked for all three of us, a style that we could all three write comfortably in and write co um, consistently in. So that um, it didn't, you know, there weren't speed bumps every time we swapped over from one writer to another. Um, and I think I changed. I, I, think, I think in that process, um, I became sensitized to some of my own default options, some of the things I'd been doing without thinking about them. And I came out of that and immediately wrote Girl with All the Gifts. Um, I don't think that's an accident. I think Girl with All the Gifts is different from anything that I'd done up to that time. Um, I think it's really good sometimes to collaborate because it shakes you loose from um, not necessarily bad habits, but just old habits, things that you do because you because you haven't examined them. What were some of those changes, or at least one or two of those changes that you had on default setting that you changed? Um, if you look at all the Casa novels, they were all um, single point of view. And pretty much every novel I've written since has been multiple point of view. Um, and we did that. We did that in both of the collaborations. Um, we, we had a number of protagonists and we wove the, wove the different threads through the story. Uh, all the casting novels were just told from Caster's perspective. Um, so that would be one of them. Um, Go With All The Gifts is written in present tense, narrative present instead of past. And um, very, very short declarative sentences to, to mimic the way a child sees the world. There's a kind of, um, there's, a, there's a simplicity, not, not, not to all of the language, but certainly to the sentence structure. And that was a, that was a conscious choice to kind of, um, to distinguish Melanie's, well, I, I guess to try and, try and capture the immediacy of a child's viewpoint. You know how, you know, when, when you're young, everything just hits you full on. Um, and, and as you get older, it's mediated more through your experience and your memories and your expectations. I wanted to try and get that kind of vividness and immediacy. And I did it through sentence structure. And I think that was because we argued so much about sentence structure when we were doing the first of those two collaborations, because I tended to write in sort of long flowery periodical sen periodic sentences. Uh, and Lou in particular wanted to, to pare it down. 
um, to give more of a sense of the you know, the Arabian Nights was um, 11th century, 10th, 11th century. Um, there's a kind of penny plainness to the style that works really well. And she wanted to try and try and mimic that. So those would be some of the things. Okay. Uh, well, anything else that we didn't cover that we should have covered, Mike? Anything else you want to make us aware of? Um, I mentioned Highest House. Um, so the Highest House is the book I did for ID, the comic book I did for IDW this year. And I'm really proud of it. They're just about to do the collection. It's only okay. six, it was a six issue mini series. It's going to be one volume. Um, Peter Gross did the art. Yuko Shimizu did the covers. And my God, they were beautiful covers. Um, I think it just worked. It worked really well. It's, it's a fantasy with political overtones. It's as, as close as Peter Gross and I will ever get to Game of Thrones. Okay. <laughs> well, Mike, really appreciate you being on the show, especially you being in the UK. I know it's very late for you right now, so I uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, Thanks, Mike. It was a great fun. I really enjoyed yeah. it. So nice. the, the name of the book that's coming out Tuesday is, again? Someone Like Me. Someone Like Me, and it's under M.R. Carey. If for, it's available, Kindle, print, uh, Audible, so however you like to consume your books it's it's available so well thanks mike i really appreciate you being on the show i hope to talk to you again sometime soon so i would love that kid mike thank you guys take care thanks mike nice to meet you nice all you, you have to do is close your browser Bye, and take you out of here so thanks mike you like a bus well, all right guy. yeah neat guy yeah yeah very much so uh Thanks, Ben, for getting that guest for us and for asking a lot of the questions today. Yeah, you can leave now, Ben. Get out of here. <laughs> See you, Ben. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, hey, Mike, before I forget, just the highest house uh, comes out on Christmas Eve here in the U.S. The, I got a link in the web page. The, oh, graphic, the graphic novel, the, yeah. the on the bus? Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I would like to, okay, uh, time permitting, take 10 or 20 minutes at the end of this show and talk about the haunting of Hill House, not Hell House, haunting of Hill House. Thank you, Kelly, uh, with spoilers. So again, I'm saving that for last so that if you're one of the three people on earth uh, who have not seen the haunting of Hill House, all 10 episodes, you can, uh, I'll tell you when to turn us off. So unless you want to turn us off now, I wouldn't blame you one bit, but I'm one of those three people. Okay. You're one too, and, and Kelly turns me off all the time, so it's no problem. Uh, so I, I do have a I do have a few other things to talk about. First of all before I forget, I, yes. I do want to mention that Lucifer, which we spent a lot of time talking on, it Comixology has it on sale right now. Yes, that's true. Six dollars for each of the five collections. So anybody that hasn't read it, I promise you'll love it. That is a lot of comics for a low price. I'm gonna check that out. Thanks yeah. for that. Yeah. Um, I hate the TV show. Am I going to still like the comic? Is it literally nothing connected whatsoever except for two characters' names? Okay, fantastic. And, club. and, a and I get the feeling that we avoided asking Mike on air if he hates the TV show or not because I think he'd say something uh, nice like um, check out the comic or something like that. <laughs> so. I not, not to speak for Mike Carey, but that's just my feeling. I, I wanted to bring it up, but yeah, I mean, I don't really feel like it's something we should devote a lot of time to. No offense yeah. to uh, Tom Ellis. I, I know that, that Kelly Young is a big fan of the show, but... Um, yeah, not at all. <laughs> speaking of shows that Kelly, Kelly Young is a big fan of, and I am as well, Titans. That, is that TV series kicking ass or what? Man, I, I got to say, if DC had showed this kind of love and commitment to their cinematic universe and theaters, the, fawns, the, the, the fans would be fawning over it. Not only that. And the fawns. And, and the, the fawns, fawns would be fanning. The fawns would be fanning and the fans would be fawning. Uh, not only that, if DC would have shown the same love that they've showed this, if they would have shown the same love to those like the Flash and Green Arrow, I think they'd have more fans. Those are, those are such melodramatic. I mean, I was a fan of the first season of the Flash, and then I think it just went all went to hell. 
you know, I, and I, I'm a DC fanatic, man, and I can't watch those shows anymore. That's that's kind of on CW also, though. They're they're kind of dictating what kind of shows they want from DC, yeah. and they're not going to let them be racy like Titans is. You know, I'll even go beyond that, though. The trailer we got of Titans. I watched that two-minute trailer, and I was completely underwhelmed. This is this series is nothing like what we got in that trailer. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I'll just end, end the TV series remarks on the CW by saying when a massive DC fan like myself isn't watching The Flash every week, isn't watching Green Arrow uh, or Supergirl every week, there, there's a problem. I mean, I guess they're going for a different demographic than DC Comics fans. So I don't know. But Titans is hitting it out of the park. Yeah, I have a fear. Um, you know, a lot of people aren't watching this show because you got to spend, you know, $8 a month to get this show. And I know you get a lot of extras, but all you get as far as new product is Titans on that. Is it DC Universe or DC Direct? DC Universe. Okay. Um, I am old enough. Actually, we are all old enough, but I don't know if you guys remember when Fox first started, uh, Fox, the the network television show, and they they had, I think, an hour of programming or two hours of programming on Sunday nights, and then yeah. the rest of that was – you know, just reruns and news and shit like that. And then they expanded to Saturday night and they gave us a couple hours there, you know, and now of course they have all of their own stuff, but they had at least, I, you know, they had a show or two that we could all kind of dig into and figure out if we wanted to watch. And, and that was free TV. This is one show. If you're not interested in anything else, they're saying, you know, well, here's this one great show, but it's still going to cost you $8 a month. That's a little, that's a little pricey when you're used to getting TV for free. Yes, and the the uh, I use Roku, and the app on Roku needs some work. However, on the plus side, the comics that are available, you can get this app for your tablet and your phone too, not just for your TV. There are a lot of comics available that read just like Comicsology in the DC Universe app. I'd be curious to see what their numbers are for subscribers because, you know, but I the agree, reason to be more new content than Titans and comic books. Yeah. The, the comic books, I don't think that's a draw to most people. Um, Probably not. The for reason superhero films are so different than the comic book is because Batman sells, you know, 50,000 comics a month and uh, 5 million people will go and see the Batman movie. They're aiming at a completely different audience. For what it's worth, the Batman the Animated Series in HD is on there, which I don't even know if the Blu-rays are out for that yet. But I know for my generation, that was a massive, um, you know, was it 92 to 96 or 7 or whatever it was? That was, that was a big reason to come home on weekdays. Yeah, and, and don't forget, Lois and Clark is on there, and I know what a big fan you are of Lois and Clark. Well, will, will this ever be on something like Netflix or some other? It's got to come on some other platform. I That's always, what I wonder. Filmstruck just, just uh, I think it ends, is it this week or next week? The Criterion. Yeah. One. And that had a lot more to draw people to it than Titans. So yeah. I have a good friend who's a massive Doom Patrol fan. He has the entire original run. He's got... Grant Morrison signing all the issues he wrote, everything. And he's like, yeah, I'll watch Titans um, when it's over and I can just get my free trial and get out of it because I'm not paying an extra $8 a month. Yeah, it's, I'm kind uh, of in I that same boat. I, I don't disagree. I, don't, I think it was a mistake to just start with one good show and old content. They should have had several shows. Yeah, I don't disagree with what you guys are saying at all. You're you're right, and they're taking a huge risk, just just doing one show. And it, admittedly, it's a fabulous show. It is my favorite show on television right now. <laughs> you know, I have the same issue with the new Star Trek series. I star, you know, I was a big Star Trek fan from way back. Uh, I just don't want to buy another s series or platform or whatever. As much as I really want to see Titans, because I love the Teen Titans TV show, and my kids were allegedly watching it. I had the same problem, <laughs> and, and I I bought into 
Star Trek, and now I and, and now it's like since I made that decision, I said, "Well, I don't want to do this again." But every time, every time a cable station has a show I might like, and I'm just I'm more of a Trek fan than a Teen Titans fan. Well, um, moving on, uh, Doctor Who. I'm a little underwhelmed with a new season, and I want to point out first of all before Kelly makes some crack about me me being a misogynistic nerd, sexist. Nerd, nerd. Oh, that part. Never mind. Misogynistic. Yeah, that part. I, the nerd part is true. That I I I do like Jodie Whittaker's performance. That's that's not the problem I have. The problem I have is suddenly the stories the stories are boring me this this season. I mean, they're just boring, and they're also preachy. Yeah, the, the spider one was a little too obviously political. So was the Rosa Parks one. And look, I get it. I have no problem with, you know, a Rosa Parks episode. But you would think that Doctor Who would know about Claudette Colvin and that she would deserve a mention on a Rosa Parks show, you know? Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with Claudette Colvin, she was a 15-year-old African-American who, in the same town, I believe, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I am, nine or ten months before Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat, uh, Claudette Colvin refused to give up her seat on a bus. Exact same scenario. And uh, she was arrested as well. And... I understand that, that everybody knows about Rosa Parks and a Rosa Parks episode and everything, but for for Doctor Who to not even at the end say something, two lines about Claudette Colvin, it was, it's, it's just, it's pretty unforgivable. Um, I had talked to Ben earlier in the day about this, that, that it, and I said it was possible. I mean, obviously, it, it, uh, they, they knew who each other were. Rosa Parks knew about the Claudette Colvin incident. Absolutely. And it's probable, it's possible, and you might even say probable, that Rosa Parks was inspired by, by what Claudette Colvin did. You know, so, and I read, I said that earlier today, and then I did a little bit more reading about it. Um, you know, there's a, there was a recent writer who said that exact same thing, that she was the spark that sparked Rosa Parks. And um, so... You well, when you get into the real history, it gets to be much more complex than that. This was actually deliberately planned out. You know, it wasn't a spontaneous decision. Right. Because they knew that this was a vile practice and they could challenge it in court. Yes, and I don't disagree with that. However, Doctor Who, right. an episode about racism and segregation and that, that mentions Rosa Parks, that it's all about Rosa Parks and doesn't even bother to mention Claudette Colvin. Uh, what the hell, man? That's all I can say. It, may, it, it almost made me angry. It, it's ridiculous. You know, so... Well, the, the problem I had was last week's is after Rosa Parks, which, which I like more than you, Mike, I wanted to get back to basics, get a more straightforward end. We didn't get, it lacked suspense at the end of that show. It just sort of stopped. I mean, this, the spiders lack bite, I'll put it that way. Yeah. And it, it looks like it we, they may be setting up Chris North to be a recurring villain later in the season and he's but, too he's too obviously a trump surrogate and uh yeah and then there's more subtle political commentary just, the the story just ended and that was it i mean yeah i don't want to spoil doctor who but it's just boring so far well you know i i i, I like the doctor i like the companions they have sure just the the, the Last episode, I'm I'm not as negative on the Rosa Parks one as you, but uh, the last episode this wasn't the best. And, and I think when they're also not going to do a Christmas episode this year for the first time ever, 
And I think they're really doing a disservice to the first female Doctor Who. Because if this, the first season with a female Doctor Who, the writing needs to be out of the park, you know, for all those misogynists out there who, you know, if it fails, are going to say it failed because, you know, Doctor Who was female. When it may be, it was the writing, you know? Oh, so, so uh, I, I need these moments where the hero totally turns things around on the villain. We're missing those great climactic things where, you know, this, you, your story ends here now, as, you know, Peter Capaldi's previous doctors would say. And then you yeah. get the music going, and he's really uh, reversed the polarity on uh, the Daleks' device, and it's going to blow them all up, or however it works. I'm missing those moments. Well, we did get that moment in the very first episode. Yeah, in the first one, it worked. Yeah, but not since then. So, uh, anyway, moving on, because I know I'm really entertaining Kelly with the Doctor Who nerd stuff. Uh, Stephen King's got a new book out, right, guys, called Elevation? Yeah, yeah I read it. It's really good. Yeah, I, I'm sure it is. But there, I guess there's a lot of debate about it being a small... Hang on, hold that up again. It's very small. This is my hand, and this is the book. Yeah, is it a small novel? Is it a novella? It's a, no it's a novella. It's a novella. I mean, it, some people seem to be upset about it. I'm not sure why. Um, Priced accordingly, isn't it? Yeah, it was like eight bucks for me on Amazon. I don't know. What, I think the retail price is a little high. The retail price is twenty bucks, which is a little high. Well, that is high. But it's seven ninety nine for Kindle. If I remember, if I remember correctly, it's seven ninety nine for Kindle. Which yeah, most Stephen King books are going to be like thirteen ninety nine or something. I yeah, was. Sorry, I good. On, on Audible, it's three and a half hours, and it was like seven dollars. I just picked it up yesterday. Can I'm really surprised that twenty dollars is a really steep price for what is an obvious novella size book. Well, then that's probably where the uh, uh, rancor is coming from, I guess. Um, but you know, you don't buy it then. Wait till it's cheaper. Can we get a non-brief summary from someone? On, uh, it's about a guy who. Uh, we're not a spoiler summary. I meant it's not. Yeah, it's not a spoiler. It's about a guy who loses weight. It's okay. You could draw parallels okay, to because I, I put on a few pounds myself, man. and uh, I would like to learn how to lose some weight. Well, it's this, that, it's that that reminds me of is that what you're saying. Um, it's it's similar to Incredible Shrinking Man or thinner in 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 yeah. in. In um, as far as the story is concerned, but not as far as the tone, a very different tone. This is a gentler, kinder, more optimistic Stephen King. Uh, it's very Joe Hilly. And I made the comment on Facebook about it being very Joe Hilly. And I got an immediate response from a couple of people, Jonathan Lees and and another couple other people saying that they had the exact same thought when, when reading it. It reads very similar to Joe Hill's uh, the tone of Joe Hill's um, novellas in his Strange Weather collection. It could have been a fifth novella. You're turning me off with the optimism, but you're turning me on to the book when you say that it was a really, really good read. I'm not so. here to turn you off. I'm here to turn you on, Mike. Yes, I... I'm not going to do it with those tiny those hands you just showed us. Make TV great again. I'd have a dime. Um, it, okay, so the bottom line is, is it a good book? Is it's it... Is it a really good book or is it an okay Stephen King book? I thought it was great. I okay. loved it. I really loved it to the point where I meet, like I finished the book and I emailed Andy Cox at um, Black Static and I was like, I want to review this book because I really enjoy it and I wanted to do a thing where I was going to compare it to Thinner and kind of get into the and Incredible Shrinking Man and he was, you know, and I he he gave it to somebody else, but um, he I'm responded gonna, with, "Who is this?" He was like, "You who?" Who is this? Uh, uh, I'm gonna, no, I'm going to do the Tim Wagner book instead. But I am going to do um, a, a piece for it for a different website because I'm just that into writing this piece. But um, no, I so thought it was it great. It sounds like a Patreon podcast. It does, yeah. Uh, because I've got, an, I've got an Audible credit all ready to go. So should I spend that Audible credit on Elevate? No, because you can buy it for 8 bucks, and your Audible credits cost you 15 bucks. 
Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, don't buy it outright if you're going to get. Oh, it. Yeah, you're right. under the people get under the the illusion that Audible credits are free. They're not. You paid fifteen dollars for that credit. So any book that I you buy, understand. anytime it's under fifteen, I do the same. Throwing thing money away. But like Kelly Young, after a long night of drinking, just tossing it down the drain. Right. Um, I, to go I, I had right. a good question about it, Philip, if you don't mind. Um, is it's a Castle Rock story, right? It is a Castle Rock story. Is it related to his last uh, Gwenty's button box or something like that? It's it's only in the it does reference okay. Gwenty's button box, um, but the same way he references his books and other stories, he he just kind of like mentions it um, in passing. Um, okay. But there is a reference to the to what ha to the suicide stairs. Which is the, oh. yeah, and Gwendy's. He also references a few other Castle Rock stories w with some characters and stuff like that. So it's, so it's fun. It's a little, he gets a little left, which I think might also be possibly um, the reason for some of the grumbling. Um, but it's not so left that it distracts. It's a, it just, the needle gets just to the point where if he went a little bit further, it would, might be a little distracting. But, but he just he he keeps it he keeps it you know few and far between. But it does. The only thing about the book that I would that I disliked, and I'm not giving anything away here, is that he portrays the re, uh, it's a modern day story, and he portrays a response to same sex uh, couple in a way that I would find very very hard to believe in today's day and age. But well, small town small town Maine. I don't live in Maine, exactly. And Maine, I live in Los Angeles, uh, Maine is a very, very red state. It's super racist. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, I'll say that this would why, not. Why do you? Time. Why do you hate lesbians, Philip? I don't know. People sure. in Maine apparently hate Mike, lesbians. Mike took my line. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't say they were lesbians. I said same sex. <laughs> yeah. I knew they were lesbians. Though. Spoiler alert! All right, so it's about seven dollars. Uh, Can I ask? Can I ask a question of Philip? It's about seven dollars on Audible. It's about seven dollars on Kindle. So I'll have to figure out which way. I, I, I don't even think. I think the hardcover is like eleven bucks on Amazon. I I paid nothing. Hard, I, it's cheap. I Sorry, it's, Kelly. What you it's, want to it's fifteen or something. I picked it up on Kindle too. Um, so Philip, I started reading it. No, it's twelve dollars. And... It's eleven dollars and ninety-seven cents on Amazon for the hardcover. I started reading it, and so you're telling me this is a present day castle rock story well that's the way i read it he okay. it, i don't think it was dated he mentioned cell phones and stuff how much do we think that gwendy's button box and this story are related to the castle rock series coming out and that's why they are set in castle rock okay. and, no, and no other reason i don't think the castle rock series is going to touch on any of stephen king's stories is it well, I'm not saying impact. that. I'm saying as as indirect promotion for that series. Oh, I don't think so. You know, it doesn't even say Castle Rock on the cover or anything like that. Yeah. Like it doesn't say Castle Rock. Like Wendy's Bond Box was like all was a big Castle deal. Rock. It was a huge deal because well, that's because he had said he was never going to write another Castle Rock story. Um, at least that's why that was my takeaway from it. But so all I can tell you is that. All I can tell you is that Gwendy's button box takes place prior to Elevation. Yeah, that's in the 70s or something, if I remember correctly. Someone well, please tell me that we're not going to get a Castle Rock Season 2. Oh, no, they've already... We, we talked about that. They're already yeah. doing it. Make TV great yeah. again. Oh, I... You guys they've already announced it. it, and I've already decided that I'm not going to watch it. That's I'm all happened already. That's all already occurred. I'll say this about his Castle Rock stuff. He said Needful Things would be the last one. And then yeah. a few years later, he did a short story in Castle Rock that's collected in uh, Nightmares and Dreamscapes. And he has a habit when something brings up a, one of his favorite properties where he'll dip back into it just because it was brought to his mind and he enjoys it. So it wouldn't surprise me if Gwendy's button box. And then he's like, oh, I kind of like Castle Rock. Let me do another one. Yeah. This is a book that should have been i would have pref i would have almost pre preferred the elevation to have been part of like another four past midnight or you know different seasons kind of a thing I, it would have been i think it would have been funner to read it along with a few other novellas but i don't know why they released it as a standalone novella i don't i don't know if they've ever i'm thinking have they ever done that with a stephen king novella 
um, other than Gwendy's. Cycle, but, Cycle of the Werewolf. Yeah, but that was like in 1935. Nobody even remembers that. 1935. Uh, he had the uh, the gun essay short. I don't know what you call it. It was novella length, but it was like a about gun rights and pro responsible gun ownership. This is the only mainstream Stephen King novella that's probably ever been released wide, worldwide, right? And I don't know why they did it. It's really to Mike's point. I don't know. Maybe they're doing it to promote Castle Rock. Maybe they, they. I mean, I can't imagine they thought they'd be riding on the coattails of the popularity of the television show. Yeah. What was the book Bye. that Haven was based on? That was based on a Stephen King book that was like yeah. a short, almost pulp novel. That what that's was true. Called? Colorado Kid. Colorado, Colorado Kid. Yeah. yeah, that was pretty short. Then he did. Blockade Billy, that was another novella. Oh, Blockade so he, Billy, yeah, that was a novella. That, that's what I'm. And even even uh, the girl of Tom Gordon was borderline novella length. Yeah, yeah. You guys, I have an awesome since you brought that up, Philip. I have an awesome pop up book of that. Have you guys seen that? Of what? Of uh, the girl who loved Tom Gordon. No, I it's it's don't fucking amazing. Read them much yeah. anymore since I turned three, I think. All right. <laughs> Why have to be so hateful? It, it is a little crazy. My, Mike, there's did, a pop-up you... Necronomicon. It's gorgeous. Yeah, that's, I have that. That's different. That's that's different. Did, did you find Tom Gordon somewhat Lovecraftian? I found the creature in the woods in that uh, a little like Shub Nigaroth. Hmm, I never thought of that. All right. Uh, there's a listener by the name of Lee Peacock who is. Uh, the managing editor of a news newspaper here in these United States. Uh, last, I bring him up because he wrote me a, uh, he sent me an email, and last Sunday we did the usual Halloween episode with Scott Thomas and, and Jeff Thomas, and one of the things we talked about was this cool book that I read when I was a kid called Stranger Than Science. You know, and the very first story in here this was supposedly true stuff and needless to say a lot of it isn't uh the, the very first story in here is called the mystery of david lang and it's about this guy in 1880 who uh, supposedly just disappeared from view like a field away in full view of his wife and kids um and some other strange things happened and i'm going to link to this later in the in the in the show comments on YouTube and um, and iTunes and so forth. So if you if you look for that, obviously during the live show it's not there and it probably won't be there till tomorrow. But I'll link to his articles. And I reading this story led me to Ambrose Bierce, who I know you guys are familiar with, but Ambrose Bierce disappeared. I, I, I'm sure Rick knows about this at the very yeah. least. Yeah, in Mexico. Yeah. During a civil war, which was very brutal, so he was probably just killed. Right. Well, he wrote this uh, weird I think he disappeared war. after this after the civil war. Well no, that 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 went that war went on forever. We're still in it. a way we're still fighting it even today. Right, but I mean that the that whole thing was Paco Villa Zapata. It went it went into the twenties. It started before World War One and ended after World War. Yeah, I, he wrote a letter to his sister telling him that he was leaving. Or anyway, whatever. It's, a, it's an interesting story. Yeah, he basically foreshadowed his own disappearance. Then he went to Mexico, and then he never, he never. Yeah, he wrote. He wrote the letter, and I'm quoting from Wikipedia here. Um, if I can find, yeah, here it is. Uh, his last known communication with the world was a letter he wrote there to Blanche Partington, a close friend, dated December twenty sixth, nineteen thirteen. After he closed this letter by saying, as to me, I leave here tomorrow for an unknown destination. Then he disappeared without a trace. Yeah. His disappearance becoming one of the most famous in American literary history. But he's obviously a brain in a jar somewhere. Obviously. Well, uh, Lee Peacock, he's written a couple of articles about who he thinks the real life David Lang is, I said all that to say this, and I will link to those. Um, but it's just this real weird, this 1854 disappearance of an Alabama uh, farmer. Uh, according to a version of this weird tale, Williamson was a farmer in Selma who vanished in 1854 
while walking across his property in broad daylight. He did so supposedly in full view of two relatives and several neighbors. Uh, like I said, I'll link to those articles. I won't bore you by reading them all on air. But it's just, you know, weird, possibly true things like that are, I think, are very intriguing around Halloween and when it's not Halloween, so all the time. Uh, thanks, Lee, for the email, and thanks for the, the articles. I'll, I'll link up to those tomorrow on YouTube and on the, sh on the show notes for the audio-only podcast. So... Two two comments, Mike. Yes, sir. There is a from Dust to Dawn sequel. I think it's Dust to Dawn Three: The Hanging with the Daughter, which ties Beers' disappearance into the vampires in Mexico from those films. That's probably it. Yeah. And um, Beers had a, a lot of sort of Charles Fort like stories. It may even have been factual based where he goes in the stream, people disappearing just like uh, this lying character. Whether, you know, somebody's seen on a road and nobody sees them again. So he, he had written about that. If your habit is to always buy a book while you listen to this podcast, I haven't read it yet, but it comes very highly recommended from Matthew Carpenter. I'll bring you the birds from out of the sky. It's cosmic horror, apparently, and it's by Brian Hodge, who we had on a couple of weeks ago. It is marvelous. Okay. Marvelous, beautifully written, wonderful prose. Uh, and it is strange, strange, terrible, and wonderful. I. Uh, uh, to, it starts off, there's a guy who's an art dealer, and... Uh, girl from West Virginia brings him a sample of art from one of her distant rel remote relatives and it's just strikingly original and so he has to go look at her other paintings that she has and it just leads him on this this journey and nothing happened the way I expected I just thought it was wonderful absorbing prose really really a gem I, I read a lot of books this week and it was the the best uh, well, all kidding aside, Matt's opinion means a lot to me, so I'll be buying that book. Again, it's I'll Bring You the Birds from Out of the Sky by Brian Hodge. Uh, a couple of other points, and then we're going to get to Hill House. Um, if you want to email the show, uh, if you enjoy the show, email us at lovecrafteasine at gmail.com. If you don't like the show... Um, Try and Google, he won't reveal it on air, but try and Google Kelly Young's address um, and give him your complaints. So, yes, all are welcome. All are welcome. Yes. Uh, we have a suggestion box. I don't know where it is, but put your complaints in there. <laughs> and then right. shove it up your ass. Uh, are, are we going to discuss Sabrina first? Uh, I've not seen Sabrina. I was going to say a couple things real quick. First of all, secret ballot. <laughs> Patreon um, got a thank you to Michael Brugman. He's a new twenty-five dollar a month Patreon, which means you get a free book every month, and you get all the Lovecraft Easy books on Kindle for free as well. So um, thanks for keeping the Easy going. Just Google Lovecraft Easy Patreon if you want to me to actually be able to continue all this stuff um yeah sabrina uh you guys liked it i haven't seen it yet i liked it i loved it <laughs> i didn't kelly I, I think you said online somewhere that it was what american horror story was trying to be or something like that no i i said that the producers of american horror story should be hanging their head in shame because this season is all about satanism and and it just falls flat from episode to episode. And Sabrina, which is arguably aimed at teenage girls, was far more compelling with their Satanism. And I, I, I just thought it went down really smooth. I, I watched every episode and, and enjoyed it all, as silly as it was. It, it's not, it, I'll say that it's pretty violent. 
it's, it's, it's not for Pete Rollick's girls, I'll put it that way. Well, I I thought it was aimed at, at teenagers, so I thought, you know, this looks cool, but is this something I'm going to enjoy as an almost adult of almost 50? I, I got to say, Mike, I, I am really having a hard time with it, even trying to pretend it's interesting. It's, I, I gotta say one of the most interesting complaints I read about it, like on the online griping was by someone who's really a Satanist and said, they're misrepresenting my religion. <laughs> well, well, there's a lawsuit going on because the statue of the devil they used in the church of the night really exists in the church of Satan somewhere. Or with the two little kids looking up at it. Why would yeah. two little kids in the goat like Satan? There's a real statue like that. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's. I think it's fun. I think it's a lot of. I mean, it's it's fun. It's fun. It's light. It does have some heavy moments. I think if you go in thinking it's more than that, you might be disappointed. But if you're going for just something light entertainment with sort of a sadistic devilish twist it's very you know it's a little harry pottery at some times um, yeah absolutely yeah, that's a, it's it's like a buffy version of harry potter it's exactly a, rick i that's a that's an excellent way to put it it's like a buffy version of harry potter that's that's yeah, exactly well, that does sound interesting actually it's yeah i mean it's fun the the, the acting's good uh gets better as it goes um yeah all right so um if you've not seen all 10 episodes of the haunting of hill house you might want to stop listening now and come back when you've seen it uh rick are you going to exit since you haven't seen it no i'm going to stay because i don't know when i'll get around to seeing it i've got too much to read and too much to watch because it, it's it's we're going to be real spoilery here have have you uh, uh i'll i'll accept have that seen? have you seen any episodes no uh, right, i will too mike because it, it, it's fine with me just go ahead the first thing I'll say is this. I really, two things stick out of my mind that I really enjoyed before I say the things that I did not care for. The identity of the bent neck lady, I thought that was great. And what the red room really was, I thought that that was great too. Uh, I would like to hear your take on what you think the red room really was. Whatever it needed to be. Right. But you know what I really liked? at the In the first episode, I think it was, when they're knocking on the door trying to get into the red room, then you see this creepy shadow move uh, under the door. Later, you find out that's actually one of their sisters in the red room playing, think it's a, thinking it's a different room. It was, it was really well done. And that was one of the few callbacks to the novel because it was Theo in the room, and she hears the loud banging. And she thinks someone's trying to scare her and doesn't, you know, thinks Luke's trying to scare her. And then she goes to the door and doesn't open it. And then that was what that was revealed to be, at least. I thought that was really clever. Yeah. Um, I think you could end at episode five and think you'd seen a really brilliant TV series. Um, uh, episode six was fantastic. Okay. I won't argue with that either. Um, the, you're right. Um, man. I watched some TV shows more than once. I cannot ever watch The Haunting of Hill House again because the last episode was just so horrible. I mean, don't laugh like you disagree. I know you agree, Young. I mean, Kelly should know better than anyone. He's the American Horror Story fan, and they stole the ending from season one because I feel like they didn't know where else to go with it. Let me just go on record as saying I fucking hate American Horror Story. I have liked one season of that show, yeah, and it I was watched, that first season. I watched the first season. I never watched anything after that. Yeah, I've it. tried to watch it, and I can't. It's a but terrible this, show. This basically stole that ending, the idea that, like, oh, well, there's this evil house that where if you die and your soul's stuck forever, we're going to do that as a family, and that's a happy ending. Yeah, suddenly the, the, the Hill House is nice in the last 15 minutes of yeah. the episode. Yeah, it got a little hallmarky at the end. I mean, come on, why? Why did they do this? It was, it was. It, yeah, it was weird because I didn't. You didn't see it coming. Like in no prior episode did you was Flanagan 
being sappy or being overly comforting. Like he was being, he was being pretty cold and, uh, and scary and creepy and bad things were like really bad things were happening to this family. And it seems strange that he thought what that series needed was a super saccharine, happy ending because it's the last thing that series needed that series needed to end at the worst with ambivalence and with the best with a good solid you know uh sc horrifying scary downbeat ending um, so here's the interesting part uh, philip uh apparently i don't remember this but there apparently there was a, a pretty distinctive window in the red room is that right right yeah okay i read that the original ending was for this sappy stuff to happen, but to show that window that they were all in the red room and that they were really. Right. And that's what I, frankly, that's what I thought was going to happen. Cause as we were watching that whole, mo like the monologue, Oh God. And then yeah. like monologue. that over, overly done, like, like I, I Shakespearean. TV, would you shut the fuck up? Yeah, man. I mean nobody talks like that. And the, and then the girl, like you know, hold my hand, catch me when I'm falling, or whatever that shit was. It was, it was so like gagging, sweet. Um, Lifetime television, and I can say that I wrote for Lifetime. But the, but yeah, I was waiting for that moment too. I was like, this is so over the top, positive. That it, it's going to all be a ruse. Like it's going to be a, isn't this all nice? Isn't everything great? Uh, or maybe it's not. And that yeah, would have been. And, and then Flanagan in an interview, uh, I'm paraphrasing, or it might have been what, the, what exactly what he said in, when I read about this. He said that would have just been too cruel. Like, what do you mean? It's, it's a horror, horror buddy. series. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even mind that it had a happy ending for a good number of the characters, but that. You know, we spent nine and a half episodes where the house was so horrible, it haunted them for 20 some odd years. And then it's like everyone forgets it, all the bad parts. It literally killed, like it killed them. Yeah. And, yeah. and that closing monologue, which was sort of taken directly from the last paragraph of the novel and then changed to be a good thing. Right. It just... I, as I said, I like I, I really like some of the characters. I liked the idea of Luke surviving and overcoming his problems. Some of the other characters, I, I thought there was a lot to um, Theo taking off the gloves and throwing them away. It's like, okay, that's all great. But but how we got to these moments was so bad. I just couldn't. couldn't. Yeah, and, and I didn't mind there being some happy endings either. I just felt it was so over the top to the point where yeah. when they showed when they showed the family around Luke with the with the big two on the birthday on his, on his I'm drug free cake. I was, I actually turned to my wife and I was like, this is going to end horribly. Cause I was like, this is too, it's too set up to fall. It's too much of a trap door. Like I just, I was shocked when it was like, and fade to black. And I was like, wait, what? Like that was else. the savviest ending I've ever you. seen. Here's a big plot hole for you. So the, if Nell's the bent neck lady, which she was, when she shows up and her husband sees her and then immediately falls down dead, that works when you don't know who the bent neck, neck, bent neck lady is. Because you think it's basically the house not allowing Nell to have any happiness, she, he, killing her husband. Then you find out that the bent neck lady is Nell. So why did her husband die? Makes no sense whatsoever. I don't. I don't know what the husband. I think the husband death was just a vehicle to get her back to the house. I don't think it was. She blamed the house for killing him, but I don't know. If a that vehicle was, to get it. That's called lazy writing. Well, I don't know. I I love this. Look, I I, and I've heard other people say a similar thing. I'm paraphr but it was the best nine nine and a half hours of television I've seen in a really really long time. Um, I loved it right up into the last 15 minutes. Uh, I'm not going to say it ruined the whole thing for me. I would, I would, I still really enjoyed it. I, um, I would have preferred a grimmer out, a grimmer, you know, outcome uh, that was more, in to more, in, you know, in line with the rest of the show's tone. And but he went happy. He went Disneyland at the end. It's not just that he went happy. It's that he changed the rules. 
Yeah, so, well, he, he, yeah, the, the back of the house. Right. Yeah, that was a that was a re, that was a little that left a sour taste because you can't. The whole point, like the whole point, is this house is this malevolent, horrible, deadly yeah. thing, and then now it's like, oh, but it's really a happy place where souls can live on forever and be with their loved ones. Yeah, Nobody's I, I, I happy. Don't find a happy that ending per se. There are a lot of a lot of horror right. novels. Yep. Horror movies, horror TV shows that there's a happy ending, they defeat the evil, whatever, blah, right, blah, right. blah. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they don't break the rules that they've spent all this time. Yeah, setting I agree. Up. That's what I I'm agree. About. I don't know what he was thinking. Well, I honestly I'll, don't. Even, I'll even go beyond that. Something I talked about to Mike about earlier, and part of it's because I'm a parent. Um, having a kid die is, I. it's something that I don't even like. Like, I can't watch Pet Cemetery ever again. Right. Now that I'm a, right. now that I'm a parent. And in this, in that last episode, you find out that girl is not a ghost. She's not an imaginary character. She's really the daughter of the caretakers, who then drinks arsenic or whatever. I, I thought that was, I thought that was great. Well, but then they're like, "Oh, it's no big deal. She's just a ghost forever. It's fine." It, it's like, wait, what? Yeah, yeah. She's in a good place now. Yeah, that that's true, Ben. Like, and because that that's that, you make you bring up a good point, which is then the the, the caretakers show up about 45 seconds after they see their daughter dead foaming at the mouth after being poisoned they're like okay look we have a we have a suggestion for you here's yeah. what we're gonna they, they, they're playing this whole they have this whole like very calm level-headed plan of attack that's not how two parents would react no they would have gone bad shit. and that's i was expecting like a big bad shit moment and that's true that's a very the, the last half of the like the last half of the last episode was it's kind of it's, it's really indefensible it's it was just a misstep, a huge misstep. That was the turning point of the episode for me. I thought the story plot that she was a real girl that dies, I thought that made perfect sense. It, you yeah. know, the mother had been kind of corrupted or driven insane. And then just, I mean, I, I'll be halfway between our two mics of today that, you know, Mike Carey liked the show and the ending. Uh, Mike Davis did not. I just, it felt neutral to me. It just felt flat and I don't want to see it ever again. It's like having the, the, you know, Kelly can relate to this. It's like you have a nice glass of scotch and the, the ice melts in it. Oh, I love it. I love that cold scotch, somewhat diluted taste. It's oh, like you have a glass of scotch and there's a worm at the bottom of it or something. Who cares? We've read the bottom by that point. <laughs> Sorry, that's tequila. Uh, anyway, yeah, you know, there. like I said, there are some movies, books, TV shows that I can watch again, and I do want to watch again because I enjoy inhabiting the world that they're in as well as the ending that makes sense in accordance with the rules of that world. But something like Hunting of Hill House, I'll, I'll never watch that show again. I just... It's too bad because I I would have I agree with you Mike I would have like I totally would have watched that because there was so much fun stuff that you could catch on the second on the second go round right exactly and uh, and now but that now that you know where it's going you just you just don't I don't know maybe if Mike doesn't have the stomach for horror maybe he's just too nice of a person yeah yeah it would be like having a uh, a show like like. A TV show that acted like it was given all these weird fiction um, clues and everything. You think you're watching this show about weird fiction and King and Yellow and all this stuff, and all of a sudden at the end, it's this fat guy who's a serial killer. You know, it'd be like that. I don't. Know. What are we? I, I to? don't. I don't <laughs> complain about that. You can have. Uh... But that was a theoretical example. I don't know what you're thinking of. No, I, I don't. But there, there are other reasons. For, there are other problems with the ending of that show, but it's not that. I mean, if you turn it around, it's it's as bad. If people, if you get into the whole like, well, come on, it wasn't just because of the happy ending. It would be like watching like, I don't know, Mama Mia, and at the end, like in the last ten minutes of Mama Mia, like what's your who was the actress in that? Gone Close or Sissy Spacek? Who's that chick? I'm proud to say that I do not know. Mamma Mia, the, the movie. Ma is it Meryl Streep? Meryl Streep. Yeah. It'd be like if she just like walked into the house and just with a knife and like stabbed all the singers and the, her daughter and the husbands. There's like six husbands or something. I don't, it's very insane. I don't know what the movie's about. I haven't seen it, but I know there's a lot of singing and dancing. And with it'd be like if they just, if she just at the end, she just like went in and started like 
literally stabbing people in the face with a knife and they all died horribly and then the movie ended people be like what the hell just happened that was don't like the worst ending over. don't forget was, the voiceover all the extras. it was this wonderful right this wonderful musical and it was so happy and i was in such a good mood and now fucking meryl streep just killed everybody and it's over that's the equivalent of what happened with ha hill house it was like right. complete tone shift and it just Messed up yeah, the whole I'll thing. say again, it's not the happy ending. He could come up with a happy ending that worked within the rules of the show. I don't want to see Meryl Streep stab anybody. No, because that's murder is wrong, yes. At, at least I've heard. But How the fuck did we get here? It's ABBA. It's an ABBA, it's, it's a, it's an ABBA yeah. movie where they sing the ABBA song. It's a Lovecraft Easy podcast. Okay. That's how we got here. All right. All right. No, All but right. like I said, no. I'll, I'll agree with Mike on this. I love some of the elements. That, that, you know, I like the idea of Luke overcoming his addiction or Theo getting rid of the gloves. It's just the way it happened. Uh, I loved it. When Luke came to, uh, uh, and he came to, and, and I was like, what? This has got to be This has got to be an illusion. He just injected rat poison directly into his veins. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, oh. I need to go they to a doctor. Could, they also could have dealt with the issue. And he was dead for like 20 minutes before that even They also could have dealt with the issue of drug use with a little bit more nuance because his brothers and sisters are like, ah, you know, a fucking loser that does drugs all the time. This guy was self-medicating, basically. You know, the drug use is not uh <laughs> drug use is a symptom of something that has gone wrong somehow in somebody's life, you know? So they could have dug into that a little bit. Well, they, they definitely very strongly alluded to the fact that he was using drugs to, so that he wouldn't have to keep thinking about the ghosts that were haunting him. Uh, I, I must've missed that. There was a whole litany of like ghost metaphors, like the ghost of, drug addiction the go drug addiction is a ghost and loneliness is a ghost and which i thought was fine i thought was fine i thought it was interesting and well you know i don't mind the metaphor stuff yeah they they handled that i thought in during the luke episode well, i don't remember which one that was i thought they they did kind of make it clear that why he was doing it and, and making the metaphor out of it it's okay just, well then I, I stand corrected but when they yeah, do metaphors in tv shows couldn't they just like up in the top right corner do a little little blue light that's a metaphor, light. metaphor that would help that would help that's a good idea i think it's a great idea yeah books too you know you could it could be like this this passage here is a metaphor all i know is in episode eight when she came when she when they were arguing the two sisters were arguing in the car and then the third ghost sister shot out from the back seat <laughs> I shat myself. I never <laughs> screamed. I have never screamed so loud in my life. My wife is to this day making fun of me because I was. What and did Stephanie just calmly look at the look at it happen? What I don't know. I think Stephanie was more scared of the fact that her husband like <laughs> leapt off the couch screaming and basically went in convulsions. Oh, man. Well, not having seen this, I'm coming to the conclusion that the guys making it realized that the only way it really should end was the way the original haunting book and movie ended and tried to compensate for it by going in a totally different direction that didn't make any sense. Well, the problem is that, too, that this really had nothing to do with the Shirley Jackson novel, The Haunting of Hill House. Absolutely nothing. And Kelly Young... Oh, God, I can't believe I'm going to say this. Mm -hmm. Made a really good point a week or so ago that now we're not going to get a nice TV, TV adaptation of The Haunting of Hill House because they did this, which this has nothing title, to do with Hill House. This title is tied up. Yep. Well, and you well, know, people are all upset with Mike Flanagan for doing that. And the reality is, you know, Shirley Jackson's estate to, you know, they cashed the check, so you know they didn't have to. No, they didn't, they didn't have to take the money. Well, you know, Rose Hill, the Stephen King uh, original story, was basically a rewrite of Haunting of Hill House. 
The the very last thing I'll say. The uh, haunting was a far worse adaption. Yes. I'll I'll give you that. Yes. The the very last thing. Owen Wilson got killed by the. And then I'll start. We're talking about we're talking about the second version of the haunting. Yeah. The Liam Neeson, Catherine Zeta Jones. Right. Not the Julie Christie. I mean Julie uh, Harris. Uh, the very last thing I'll say about this is that um, I was kind of taken aback that the voiceovers, you know, what walked in Hill House, walked alone, right at the beginning, you know, and all that was done by one of the brothers. It, this is a Shirley Jackson novel written by a woman. I mean, really, it shouldn't have been one of the sisters doing this voiceover. Well, he was the one who wrote the book yeah well then why isn't one of the sisters the writer yeah, one of the sisters is named shirley i was like why didn't they make her the writer yeah yeah it it i, I, I don't get that at all well so. she had the she was the she was the funeral director yeah, whatever. Uh, oh never mind then oh yeah okay well anyway do you guys know that theo is mike flanagan's wife Yes. I yes. Did not know that. Now you know. She was also starred in Hush and co-wrote Hush. That's so weird. His wife was also and, in Absentia. And Gerald's Game. Did uh, does this have room for a season two, or is it ended? God, I hope not. <laughs> Super highly rated, so I'm guessing there will be a season two. Perhaps they well, make it an adaptation of the story. I've heard that they <clears throat> Flanagan said he wouldn't say yay or nay when they asked him about a season two, but he did say that it would not be the same family. He said if they did do it, the family, this story with this family is done. He won't go back to the family. Lest I be accused of trashing Mike Flanagan, I have touted Absentia as one of the best Lovecraftian films. I've touted that movie for years. Um, Mike Flanagan does great work. Uh, I just strongly disagree, and I think a lot of people on this panel strongly disagree with the ending and a few other things that could well, have been handled a lot better. I think Mike's great. I think he's an. I think he's a great. I think Hill House, like I said, I thought it was the best nine and a half hours of TV I've seen in a decade. Honest, I loved it. I was like, I was like a kid in a candy shop, and. I just disagreed with the ending. You, you don't watch Rick and Morty. That's what you're saying. <laughs> there, there are these great movies that are sometimes out there which are wonderful for 95% of the movie and then they fall apart. Well, in, endings are hard to stick, man. Look at Stephen King. It's a, They're hard to stick. It's hard, yeah. very, very hard to stick an ending. This, you know what I thought of when after I watched The Haunting of Hill House was, was Chuck in season five of Supernatural saying that is something along the lines of any idiot can shit out a, a beginning and a middle, but endings are hard. <laughs> yeah, well, well, what this makes me think of, and I'm not going to mention, you know, I'm a big fan of Fritz Lang's work in the 40s. It was one movie where they told him at the end, make it all a dream. <laughs> and it yep. ruined the movie. You know, that's, that's a cop out. Oh, everybody's okay. The guy was just dreaming. Nobody got murdered. Nobody committed suicide. And then they did that again in Dallas. Yes, I was going to say it worked for Dallas. It's oh, good yeah. enough. If it's good enough for Dallas, it's good enough for everybody. So. Uh, and then he's making Doctor Sleep now, right now, filming it as we speak. That's <laughs> this is Smokey. This is, oh Jesus! This is Smokey, by the way. So we can write a horror story. We're all, all, all the panelists here, except for me, since I don't have one, and probably Matt, are controlled by cats. Smokey's a rescue. Yeah, I just had to. All right, now you can go away, rescue cat. cat. Well, we've gone on longer than usual. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for watching and listening. Um, yeah, Mike Carey, he's got that, that book coming out, uh, M.R. Carey. Why do I keep forgetting that title? Someone Like Me, is that right? Uh, someone like me comes yeah. out November sixth. Right on Tuesday, two in two days. Two days. Um, so anyway, uh, pick that up. Definitely pick up uh, Lucifer on Comicsology if you use Comicsology. 
Or you can do it on Kindle and it comes to your thing. They're the uh, same. Yeah, that's the same thing. Yeah. thing. Oh, yeah. Buy one on yeah. Comixology now. So. My nerd rating just went down five points. Yeah, it really did. Yeah. Um, 12. And, um, thanks, everybody, for watching and listening. Ben, thank you for handling a lot of the questions. Guys, thanks for being here every week. I really appreciate it. We will see everybody next week. Thanks.